useful for developing a um, Christian culture. And so as a, a culture uh, values the sanctity of God's worship, the sanctity of the family, the sanctity of life, the Lord's Day, um, uh, marriage, property, private property, the, the requirement to speak the truth, um, all these things uh, will develop a, a prosperous, peaceful society. Um, but when society drifts away from these commandments, drifts away from obeying God, then all kinds of uh, problems develop within the culture. It, it does not prosper. It descends into poverty. Uh, you look at the Soviet Union, which denied God and uh, adopted a, uh, a communist system of uh, the ownership of private goods by the state and so forth, and it resulted in drunkenness, um, immorality, all kinds of things, along with the eventual impoverishment of the nation. So, um, to the extent that we uh, respect God's law in our culture, uh, our culture will flourish and prosper and be a peaceful society. As we get away from that, um, then... Uh, well, we can put it this way, all hell breaks loose. Um, uh, uh, things begin to decline. Now, it, it might take time, may take a couple of generations to see the effects of this. God is very patient and kind with uh, his creatures, but nonetheless, uh, there are consequences for disobeying God's commandments. So, uh, that has to do with the life of the church as well, within the, the local Christian church as together we walk in fellowship with each other and honor God's word. Um, our churches flourish and grow um, according to God's will and uh, we, we also hopefully will build strong families uh, for the future as well. So today I want to look at the Tenth Commandment and conclude our study of the Ten Commandments as a whole. Okay. And then we'll, look we'll uh, get started again. Let's pray as we get started. Father in heaven, we do thank you that we can come together to meditate on your word. And we pray that as we reflect on the uh, scriptures and how they lead us to Christ, that your spirit would bless our time together, strengthen us in our Christian walk, that we might be pleasing to you and enjoy your blessing on our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, we come to the Tenth Commandment, which uh, emphasizes the significance of the heart in uh, obedience to God. Um, you recall when you read through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks to the Pharisees about uh, the accustomed teachings that have been passed down to them. They're, he's talking about the Pharisaical um, interpretations and applications of God's law where they really sought to minimize and reduce the impact of God's law on life. And so they kind of explained away its impact. And Jesus uh, corrects their teaching and shows that the outward command does not merely govern outward behavior, which is what the Pharisees were trying to do, but it also addresses our hearts. It addresses, um, it addresses the kinds of things that come up from above, um, so the, 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 the heart is, you may need to turn your volume down as I speak up a little bit, so I apologize here. I'm trying to get my dad included. So the, the heart is the, the, the core of our experience and our walk with God. And the Pharisees had misunderstood God's law. They made it an external thing and did not respect the internal aspects of the law of God. And so Jesus corrected that by reminding us that uh, the, the command, you shall not commit murder, does not only have to do with actually knocking your, your neighbor's head off, but it also involves the attitudes of the heart, anger and hatred and things like that. And so the heart is very much involved in the whole process of obedience before God. And you recall that the Pharisees talked about washing your hands and all these outward ceremonial things. And Jesus said, it's not these things which corrupt you. It's the things that come up from the heart. Out of the heart flow all kinds of idolatries and immoralities and so forth. And so Jesus 
points to our hearts as the fountain of ethical living. And uh, the, the Ten Commandments themselves then wrap everything up by coming zeroing in on our human hearts and how we respond to the law of God. Oh, my God. So it's God's commandments and the Ten Commandments speak to all of us and it addresses our hearts and not merely our outward behaviors. We'll begin reading in the Tenth Commandment here as uh, Reverend Cummings explains that for us. It has to do with the heart. Remember, the commandment is, uh, you shall not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's house, uh, your manservant, his maidservant, and so forth. And so the desires of the heart very much come into view here. This last commandment concerns the inner desires of the heart. We are not to be discontent, envious, or jealous of the reputation or possessions of our neighbor. Instead, rejoice in your neighbor's prosperity. Don't live for material possessions. Don't crave them more than anything else. Watch out, Christ solemnly warned. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. As found in Luke chapter 12. What was that? A light or something? Yeah. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Mark 8 verse 36. Covet most of all the riches of God's grace. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6 verse 33. Loving God first and most of all and receiving from him all that his wisdom and goodness entrusts to you, be content with that. Say with Paul, I know what it is to be con I know what it need I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So we have in these two paragraphs Jesus warning us that we must watch our hearts and guard them and then uh, noticing that you can lose everything if you forfeit your soul. So clearly the soul is of uppermost importance to Christian living. And uh, the, the, the second paragraph emphasizes the more positive aspect of the command tells us not to covet all these things, but our hearts should be set on the Lord. Positively, we are to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Well, <laughs> I anticipated what he had to say. Christ summarized these commandments in one basic law, the law of love. This law is in two parts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's quoted from Matthew 22. The essence of the Christian life is to respond to the gift of God's saving love in Christ. Then give ourselves entirely to him. To say with John Calvin, My heart, O Lord, I give to thee, promptly and sincerely. To love him is to want to keep his commandments. To love him is to love his children, whether his children by creation or by redemption. In fact, if we truly love God, we can't help but love his children. The Ten Commandments show us how to express our love for the Lord and our neighbor in the way that pleases him. So we're reminded again of the spiritual nature of the Ten Commandments and how they address the, how they address the whole of life. Uh, they uh, govern the whole aspect of our Christian living, from our outward conduct to our speech uh, to our thoughts and desires as well. We are entirely open before God. He sees us thoroughly and completely. And so he expects that we uh, transform our hearts and minds and bring them into conformity with his love and grace. So I'll finish there our consideration of the Ten Commandments. And before I go on, I'll just see if there are any questions about the Ten Commandments in general or the interpretation of one of the commandments. If you have something that you'd like to bring up, um, we could consider that at the moment.
some areas of consideration are capital punishment, um, a just war theory in terms of the Sixth Commandment, um, gay marriage and that kind of thing in the Seventh Commandment. Um, those are things that I think that the commandments address and so you can see that they have great impact not only upon personal behavior but also on uh, our civic duty and the responsibilities of governments to uh, lead people in a way which um, honors God's Word. Well, we'll continue. As we look at this sort of thing, we find the Ten Commandments uh, covering all of life and uh, even addressing our hearts. We might be overwhelmed by it and wonder how can we keep these commandments uh, in, in any measure of perfection. And obviously in this life, it seems to me we cannot rise to the level of perfection. There's always going to be temptations to sin and failures on our part along the way. But one of the great aspects of Christian teaching about the, the moral life is that we're not just simply given a set of duties that we're, we are obligated to perform, but God also gives us grace and strength to obey these commandments so that we are not left to ourselves, but we have the help of God to, to honor his word. So we'll read through what Reverend Cummings has to say, and, and then I'll make some comments as well beyond that. So he begins by saying, how can we live a life of passionate love for God and for people? Certainly not in our own strength. Failure is never so sure in the Christian life as when we think that in our own strength alone we can succeed. Apart from me, Christ warned, you can do nothing, John 15, verse 5. But I can do everything, Paul said, through him who gives me strength, Philippians 4, verse 13. United to Jesus Christ, we have new grace, both to want and to be able to do what pleases him, Philippians 2, verse 13. The chief resource for spiritual nourishment and growth in grace is God's Word. To grow in grace, therefore, is an essential, is, it is essential to be faithful in reading and studying God's Word and in attending public worship. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ, Romans 10, verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your Word is truth. John 17, verse 17. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. In addition to the Word, God has also provided the sacraments and prayer as means to grow in grace. These are subjects of a later chapter. I wanted to take a moment to expand on this idea of this, the importance of having strength for obeying these commandments. Uh, the natural man on his own, uh, living according to the flesh, does not have the ability to obey the commandments of God. Uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that uh, they are hostile, in fact, to the law of God. They're not able to obey God's law. There is an inability to keep God's commandments. And so that is the, the foundation for human life because of our union with Adam and his sin and the sinful nature that we have inherited from him. The natural man in his flesh is unable to please God, does not even desire to do so. Uh, in fact, he's hostile to God's law. And so he seeks to replace God's law with, with his own law, with his own form of worship and own form of living. So when we give the natural man the law of God and uh, urge him to obey that law, it is only going to frustrate him. Uh, he, he will never be able to respond to that adequately. It will only expose his sin and show his need for a savior, a mediator to to uh, rescue him from the, the just demands of God's law and from the consequences of his own disobedience. 
So in our own strength, we cannot obey God's law. But when we are redeemed in Christ, we have planted within us a new nature. We are born again. So we have a regenerate nature. And so now we have power, which we did not have before, power to obey God. What is more, we are joined to Christ through a living faith. And in that union with Christ through faith, we have a, a, the vitality of his life living within us. His resurrection power is now at work within us. His cross, we are joined to Christ in his cross in that we put to death the old nature and all of its sinful activities. But we are also united to Christ in his resurrection. And we have the fellowship of Christ's resurrection within us so that we have this power to live a new life. It's resurrection power. And uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 prays for the church at Ephesus and for us at, in general that we might know the power of Christ's resurrection. We need this power to live a new life. Just as Jesus rose from the dead and walked before God, indeed entered into heaven and now serves God in heaven, so also we who are joined to Christ are joined to his resurrection life and are now enabled to live before God this new resurrection life. Not only so, we have Christ dwelling within us uh, and we are to abide in Christ. Remember, as Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room in John chapter 15, he used the illustration of the, the, vi the vine and the branches. And he said, except you abide in me as the branches abide in the vine, you cannot bear fruit. And so within the Christian life, we need to abide in Christ, live in him. And, and he went on to say, abide in his word, keep his commands. This is what it means to abide in Christ. We meditate on his word. We have fellowship with him in his word. Uh, we uh, learn to obey what he has to say to us through meditating on his word. So abiding in Christ, the Christ who dwells within us, uh, enables us to live a new life. We have the spirit of God also dwelling within us. Jesus told his disciples that he would give them another comforter, the spirit of truth, who would lead them into the truth. And so at Pentecost, he pours out his spirit upon the apostles and upon the church. And so we have this new power at work within us, the resurrection power of Christ, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, who enables us to understand the truth and enables us to obey that truth. And what is more, the spirit of God assists us in our prayers, helping us to pray and then praying along beside us in words that are too deep for us to understand. And so we have all of this help for the Christian life to enable us then to live before God and to do His will. It's not that we are perfect by any means. We continue to have the old nature at work within us. But we have dramatic powers now at work within us. The powers of the kingdom of the coming age. And these great spiritual forces are now at work within the life of the Christian so that we are enabled then to love God, love his word, uh, delight in the fellowship of his people, seek to serve his people, and seek to bear witness to the rest of the world of the saving power and work of Jesus Christ. All this comes about by God's great grace, and it makes a transformation in our lives. It begins, uh, I think in some ways, it explodes in our life at first as we have great joy and eagerness to know Christ, when we first come to faith, and then as we face various challenges in life, we depend upon Christ and his grace to uphold us and to strengthen us for the various challenges that we have. We need patience. We need kindness. We need uh, gentleness. We need love. All these kinds of things. And we look to Christ for these things. Part of your prayer life ought to be praying that the fruit of the Spirit is more evident in your life. Uh, more perfectly displayed in your life. Uh, and so you have this wonderful provision of God for your Christian life that the unbeliever does not have. They are left on their own, to their own fleshly nature. They do not have the help of the Spirit. They do not have the indwelling Christ. They do not have the guidance of God's Word that instructs them and informs them because they've rejected God's Word. And so 
no wonder they cannot please God or live a life pleasing to Him. But the Christian has a transformed life. And that becomes evident by the fact that you read God's Word, you pray, you attend Christian worship, you fellowship with God's people, you seek to grow in your Christian life, and you battle with sin from day to day. You confess your sins, you seek forgiveness, and you seek to do better with each day. And so uh, we have a, a great purpose for Christian living and living for the glory of God. We have a new standard for Christian living, which is the Ten Commandments as a summary of God's will for us. And those commandments apply to all of life. Uh, you can bring deductions from those commandments to all different kinds of aspects of human life. And then we have the strength that comes to us through our redemption to enable us then to live for God and to follow after Him. Uh, yes, we sin. Yes, we fall short of that standard uh, day by day. But where would we be uh, apart from God's grace? Uh, where would we be left on our own? Uh, so we are grateful for the Spirit of God and the work of God in our lives. So with that, we'll finish up our look at the Christian life. Um, if you have questions about that later on, certainly uh, bring them up or a question even now. That would be fine. Um, you'll notice that Reverend Cummings gives us a variety of questions uh, to help us uh, remember key points in our study and then questions for review or for discussion. Uh, we don't get to go through all those because we'd be here for another hour at least <laughs> working through them. Okay, so we'll, we'll continue on and look at uh, chapter number five. I think Betty asked, maybe it was Pauline last week, at, I think it was Pauline asked last week about uh, the church and how do you define the church. Maybe it was the previous week or so, but uh, now we get to explore that a little bit in, in more detail. And uh, this is a, a very uh, important chapter. Um, it covers a lot in a brief period of time. And uh, I don't want to get too far into everything here, because this, this could take us a year, at least, going through these things. So we're, we're, what we're trying to do is give you kind of an overview. And I, I'm supplementing and adding so that uh, hopefully you're getting real value here from your study. Um, oh, we got Justin, one of our church members, coming in to join us. That's fine. So... Uh, Justin, welcome. Glad you're able to join us this morning. We are making our way through uh, Confessing Christ, which you have uh, already gone through already with Rick, but we're going probably in more detail than what, what you and Rick have been able to do. And we're looking at the fifth chapter now on the doctrine of the church. So, um, Justin is a... Uh, uh, an advanced scholar <laughs> uh, in this and that he's gone through it already and uh, but no he'll, he'll join us and uh, we'll, we'll make our way through this so now we're going to talk about the nature of the church we've talked about uh, God and Christ scripture the Bible uh, the Christian life and now we'll talk about the church we ought to be a part of Christian people and have fellowship with them so um, we have that uh, to consider now so let's get started. When you believe in Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you become a child of the living God. You are adopted into the family of God. Now comes the desire to become a member of a church with others of God's family. You recognize your need for the ministry of the church. You want the fellowship of other Christians. You want to be of some service to your Lord. But which church should you join? Should you just join the nearest one? Should you look for a big church with a good choir or a church geared to an active social life? Should you choose a small, friendly church where they'll call you by your first name? Just what do you look for in a church of Jesus Christ? What is a church? What identifies a true church? A lot of questions there, and I think important questions to consider when you come to faith in Christ and uh, you're considering, well, now what next? 
Um, what church should I be a part of? And there are many options, of course. Uh, here in Perkasy, probably within two miles of where I live, there are probably at least five, six different churches of different denominations. Um, and, and in the broader Penridge community, there's probably uh, double that at least of the kinds of churches. Some small, some traditional, some contemporary, some uh, very large. And uh, so um, with all of these many different churches to choose from, which one would you consider for yourself? And so we'll consider that this morning, uh, get started with that. Uh, and uh, I, I kind of think of uh, my friend Bob Minnick years ago, Chuck and Tamara will remember him when he would talk about our church at First Church in Perkasy and how he would, would say that um, we should describe ourselves as the little uh, church on the corner, Fifth and Ray Streets, little red church and a red brick church. And that's kind of what we are. We're a family type church, uh, small, kind of like the, the television show Cheers. <laughs> Come to our church and everybody knows your name. <laughs> uh, so, uh, welcome to First Church. But uh, we'll get started here and consider what is a church, what you should look for in that. The first thing that often comes to mind in thinking of a church is a building, usually with a steeple. Obviously a church meets in a building, but the building is not the church. A church existed long before any church buildings. The Greek word for church in the New Testament was used to identify the Old Testament people of God in the wilderness in Acts 7 verse 38. Several times in his letters, Paul speaks of churches meeting in various people's homes. In each case, there was no structure that would meet the description of a modern church building. I think all of us here understand that, that uh, the church uh, is composed of the people of God and not merely uh, the building itself, although we kind of fall into the natural idea of saying, let's go to church or I'll see you at church on Sunday or something like that. Uh, but the, the word church is, in the Greek, the word is ekklesia, those who are called out. It's, uh, in the Old Testament, it is the assembly of the Lord. It's the gathering of God's people together at a particular location. And as Reverend Cummings notes, if you go through the New Testament, you find that the people were meeting in individual homes for the most part as they get started. They didn't have church buildings. Remember, they uh, had to leave the synagogues as Paul went to various uh, places and preached. And uh, he, he left with a number of people from the synagogue and they would meet in homes forming a Christian church. Or they would meet in a school. You remember in Ephesus, Paul met at the school of Tyrannus for a period of time, for like, I think, three years. And so the church gathers in a wide variety of places as it gets started. When I was in Brownwood, Texas, we met at a community center uh, in town. Uh, other churches might meet at a gym or in a school building or something like that. Uh, there are a wide variety of ways in which churches start, including, of course, meeting in individuals' homes. And uh, uh, so... Uh, Christ said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in their midst. And uh, that's what counts for the formation, the beginning of a Christian church. The presence with Christ, with his people, even if there are only two or three. Um, but that's where we start. The church is a body of believers, not a building. Paul speaks of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28. It is the body of believers for whom Christ died. Paul says of Christ that God appointed him to be head over everything for the church, who is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. Christ is the head of the church. Believers are the body of the church. The body of believers united by faith to Christ, the head, is the church of Christ. So this just gives us some uh, development from the scriptures themselves. Uh, the definition of the church is the, the people of God. And Christ is the head of that uh, body of believers. 
The church is understood in two different senses. There is the invisible church, so-called because we don't see it. It is the church as God sees it, composed of all those who ever have believed or ever will truly believe in Christ. There are no hypocrites in this church. It is the perfect church, the eternal church. This church will be seen only in heaven. Um, so the invisible church may be at First Presbyterian Church in Percasey, in that all those who are truly believers in Christ are members of that invisible church, but then there may also be some who are at First Church or at other churches who are not truly believers yet. Uh, and they, they might even be on the rolls of the church. They might have made a profession of faith in Christ and joined the church, but they are not themselves truly believers in Christ. And so they're not members of the invisible church, which is really the, the true believers, the elect of God, those whom Christ purchased with his own blood. But the invisible church are those whom God knows and God sees. And so we go on in the next paragraph. There is also the visible church, the church we see every day all around us. The visible church contains some who profess to believe in Christ, but really don't. Their hypocrisy may be more or less obvious. In Christ's day, the visible church had one member named Judas, who betrayed his Lord. This visible church can be recognized as having a certain external organization with officers and formal public worship services. The visible church is the topic of this lesson. So the visible church is what you see uh, from street corner to street corner, all the various uh, gatherings of people in different places who profess to be Christians and uh, gather for public worship. Are they truly members of Christ's church? Or are they false churches? You remember Jesus in the book of Revelation talks about those who are uh, actually a synagogue of Satan. The synagogue was, if you will, the Old Testament church. It's a gathering place of God's people. And yet they could be synagogues of Satan in that they had abandoned true faith in God and were uh, following a false religious belief. And so... There is a visible church, and it may have uh, officers, public worship, and all the rest of it. It may claim to be Christian, but in fact is not truly Christian. So uh, the visible church is not always a true Christian church. Satan is always at work trying to deceive and mislead many. And so he continues, the first thing to examine about any church is its foundation. Is it built on the truth that Jesus Christ, excuse me, that Jesus is God and Savior? Christ is the only builder of the church. I will build, he says. People can't build a church. Only Christ, through his word and Holy Spirit, can create a body of believers. So the foundation of the church is its confession of faith in Jesus Christ. And those who make that confession can only do so because Christ has so worked in their hearts to enable them to make that profession of faith. Remember when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, oh, this and that, you know, you are Elijah the prophet, you are this and that. And then he says, but who do you believe that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, uh, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is on Christ, or excuse me, on Peter confessing Christ, and that confession of Christ as uh, Son of God, on which the church is being built. And so, um, that's where we look to start. What is the foundation of the church? Go ahead, Pauline. Yeah. But Jesus dwells within his church. He can't be identified with the church itself, uh, but he dwells within us. And he causes the church to rise up again. We dwell in Christ. It's, it's a very interesting thing. You have the indwelling of Christ in the church, and the church is dwelling in Christ. There's a mutual indwelling between Christ and his church, and yet 
Christ is not identified with the church, and at the same time, the church is not identified with Christ. There remain distinct uh, identities. Christ died for the church and gave himself up for her. But Christ dwells in the church and empowers the church. Did you want to say more? Or Yeah, he, he said, uh, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so Christ is the one who builds his church. It is a spiritual temple, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. And we are members of that temple built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And so you have the, the work of Christ as uh, foundational to the whole church. And then that work of Christ is understood, interpreted, and uh, uh, codified, if you will, canonized by the apostles and prophets as they write scripture. And then the church is built, the people of God are built on that testimony of the apostles and prophets to the work of Christ and the person of Christ. And that's what the church is built upon. And that, you know, this gets us into a further uh, study, but uh, the, that foundation is the word of God. And uh, remember Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount says that uh, there's those, there are those who build their home on the foundation of his word and others on the shifting sands. It's the word of God as given to us through the apostles and prophets. That's the foundation of the church. And that foundation is laid once through their ministry and not multiple times over the course of time through a continuing stream of apostles as taught in the Roman Catholic Church or a continuing stream of charismatic prophets or uh, people who are inspired to say, thus says the Lord. No, it's... That word of God that's given to us once for all in Scripture, um, that is the foundation of the church on which we are built. And then Peter says we are being built like a, a spiritual temple, as living stones into this temple. Um, so it's a, a beautiful image, uh, and, and Christ dwells within us by his Spirit. Um, yes, we are the, we, there you go, there you go. It, it's, all true believers uh, are, are, are that church. We are the, the temple of God, and God dwells within us. And so the Old Testament picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness and then the temple that was built by Solomon, uh, that, that becomes a, a, a type of God's dwelling with his people. And so the temple becomes the, the living people of God who trust in Christ. And Christ dwells within us by His Spirit. And so, we are the, the, the uh, living temple of God in this uh, New Covenant age. I'm not sure if we read this or not. A vital relationship exists between Christ and His church. When Peter confessed Christ as the Son of the living God, Christ said, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Here Jesus declares that the apostles, with Peter as their spokesman, note, Peter represented the apostles and gave their confession. It was a combined confession. He was their spokesman. So it wasn't just on Peter alone that Jesus was going to build the church, as the Roman church teaches, that Peter was the first pope, the vicar of Christ. And uh, a, a continuing succession from Peter uh, leading to Rome would be the way in which Christ would build his church. No, Peter was making a confession on the basis of or, or representing all of the disciples there that Jesus was the Christ and it's that confession that uh, Christ builds his church on it. Um, uh, here Jesus declares that the apostles are the foundation of his church as they confess and reveal that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And it refers to Ephesians 2, verse 20, which I spoke about a moment ago in chapter 3, verse 5. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. The first thing to examine about any church is its foundation. Is it built on the truth that Jesus is God and Savior? Christ is the only builder of the church. I will build, he says. People can't build a church. 
Only Christ through his word and Holy Spirit can create a body of believers. Seems to me I read that before. <laughs> anyway, um, you, you see here the truth about Jesus is God. And that really strikes out the mainline Protestant churches which deny that Jesus is uniquely God. At best they say that he is a part of a pantheistic spirit, that he was in touch with the divine consciousness, the divine ground of being, and he was more advanced than the rest of us, and he's encouraging us to discover our own participation in the divine ground of being. That's language from Paul Tillich, uh, a Lutheran theologian. Uh, there's a lot of Lutheran churches here in this area, here in the Perkesee, Penridge area. And so uh, this idea, uh, it's really a pantheistic idea uh, that uh, we all have a spark of divinity within us and Jesus helped us to discover this, uh, really uh, denies that Jesus is uniquely God, the, the second member of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God, uh, separate from the rest of creation. That's a view that the mainline Protestant really does not accept. Uh, and they, they deny that in their teaching. They have a different view of the divine nature of Jesus. It's more of a pantheistic point of view. So, uh, discover what the church says about Jesus. Christ is also the owner of the church. He calls it my church. It doesn't belong to any hierarchy, priest, or pastor, to any individual or group. Christ alone died for, his, for the church. He purchased it with his own blood. It belongs exclusively to him. He alone, therefore, has the right to rule the church. Through his word, we come to know Christ's will for the church. This church, founded upon and built by Christ, is indestructible. Death itself cannot destroy it. Of his kingdom or church, there is no end. I had it handy, I'd show you our Orthodox Presbyterian form of government, which I think it's in my briefcase at the moment. Uh, but the very first chapter of that is on Christ as King. And uh, it identifies that uh, the sovereign over the church is not a pope, it's not a council, it's not uh, an assembly of people, what have you. It is Christ himself. He is the final authority for the church. And he rules over all things for the life of the church and so we need to submit our church to Christ's leadership and, and governance as he reveals that to us in his word. In his letter to Timothy Paul describes some of the basic characteristics of the church. He is concerned for correct behavior in God's household which is the church of the living God the pillar and foundation of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. Timothy was laboring within the shadow of the magnificent temple of Diana of the Ephesians. He might have been tempted to think that the church of Christ suffered in comparison, since Christians held their meetings in a hall or private homes. But what would a person see who looked into the massive temple of Diana? Only a statue of a lifeless goddess. Do you get the stupendous contrast? Christians may meet in modest surroundings, but they worship in the presence of the God who is alive. God lives in the midst of his church as his household. This teaches us the indescribable privilege of Christian worship. We're not doing God a favor. He is waiting to do a rich favor for us. The living God promises to meet with us heart to heart. As we draw nearer to him, he intimately draws nearer to us and lets us know he is with us through his Holy Spirit. We have fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with one another in Christ. That's a tremendous statement there. When you think about uh, our church, I, I think about our little church here on the corner, the red brick building, a uh, small church. Um, you could maybe squeeze 80 people comfortably and uh, even up to 100 or so uh, if you're really putting chairs out on the side and so forth. Uh, but 
you look at our church, it's a, a, a rather plain building. Uh, nothing particularly glorious about it by comparison with some of the other churches in the community uh, and certainly some of the, the, the bigger churches outside uh, the area. And there are some very lovely, beautiful church buildings. And I, as a minister, uh, enjoy looking at church buildings. It's kind of one of my hobbies that I don't get to practice much. But whenever I go into a town, I enjoy seeing different forms of church architecture. And I have pictures of different places here and there. Um, it, it's a wonderful thing. I think of a, a church in uh, Harrisburg. I believe it's Harrisburg. Where you walk in and uh, there are wood floors all the way throughout the, the building. And then a uh, wood ceiling up above, and you walk and you hear the echo of your footsteps all through the, the church. And a high ceiling and uh, 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 stone walls with uh, stained glass windows to it. And it's just a beautiful thing with the wooden pews and so forth. And I, I kind of love that sort of thing. And I sometimes feel uh, uh, wistful in, in the thought that I would have loved to have been able to spend my ministry in a building like that um, with a nice choir and you know the, the rich sounds of an organ and these kinds of things and maybe a, a, a little orchestra along with it you know let's let's dream while we're at it you know <laughs> um, but in, in God's providence has not come about in my life but in truth we have in our particular church and others like it you have a wonderful fellowship of God's people uh, because Christ dwells in our midst. And I think one of the great things is to meet together for church and to really have the sense that today Christ met with us in his word. And Christ spoke to me about my faith in him and how I should live before him. And it's those moments, I think, that you kind of live for when you're in fellowship with each other and the word of God comes to you and it speaks to you in a very powerful way. And then it doesn't matter if you got a thousand people there singing the Hallelujah Chorus or just a handful of people and a few odd voices uh, singing um, you know, our opening hymn, the old 100th hymn. Um, now it's escaping me. All people that on earth do dwell. Is that how it starts? Anyway. So it's just a... a, a a humbling thing and yet a wonderful thing when there's just a few people gathered together to worship God by His Word and Spirit. And that's a great encouragement. Um, and so now the one thing that has encouraged me as a pastor as I look out on my congregation, sometimes there's only you know a handful of people there. And there are times when the church has you know, got a good, you know, all the congregations there for the most part, and that's really exciting for me. I love seeing that. As one of our hymns say, I lo we love to see your churches full. And so there's a great blessing in seeing all of God's people gathering together. But even when a lot of people are away, a handful of people are sick, and there's just a handful of people there, I remind myself that uh, what counts is the presence of Christ among his people. And where two or three are gathered together, he says, there I am in their midst. And so as I preach, I preach with all the joy and desire uh, that I can uh, for those two or three or whoever many are there, as if there were a thousand people in attendance as well. Uh, because th the focus needs to be on Christ and his presence in our midst. Uh, so, uh, a little advertising or commercial. If you should begin a small church up there in uh, Constableville, New York, um, it, it may start in a, in a home and be rather modest with a handful of people gathering from you know one Sunday night to the next or a Sunday morning as well, uh, a Bible study and a fellowship time. But you'll find that that's a great time of blessing and encouragement as you draw together and, and as other people begin to join in and there's an excitement developing in that group, that can be a wonderful thing. Um, so just planting a little seed there, <laughs> something to consider. But anyway, uh, the final paragraph, and we'll finish here for this morning. Incredibly sweet is the fellowship of sinners redeemed by grace, united in faith and love to Christ. Paul reminds Timothy of the high and holy calling of the church. It is the pillar and foundation of the truth. More magnificent than the stately columns holding up the marble roof of Diana's temple are the living pillars of the church church 
supporting the truth of God's word. Notice that Paul doesn't say that the church is the truth. No church is perfect. The church is, the church is simply the pillar and foundation that supports the truth. As the church faithfully proclaims the truth, sinners receive life and believers grow strong. And so, uh, within the life of a small church, we need to be committed to the truth. And we, we, we share that truth in a loving way to enable people to see Christ and His work. And that truth cuts at times between truth and falsehood. And sometimes people don't like what we have to say if indeed it is true and faithful to Scripture. Um, and people will fall away. The Apostle John spoke about that in his epistles. Can you imagine the Apostle, having the Apostle John as your pastor and yet people wandering off? Or having the Apostle Paul preaching to you and having other people coming in saying, Paul's not speaking the truth. Listen to us. You know, the, the early church was a very dynamic situation. Um, and you have people coming and going. Uh, false teachers coming into the church and having to be rebuked and, and driven out of the church and people leaving the church of their own accord. And Paul saying to Timothy, you have people gathering teachers uh, with itching ears. They, they, they want a teacher who will tell them what they want to hear. Flatter them, basically. Tell them they're all very good. Uh, that God just loves them so much. And you know, don't worry about anything. God will take care of them. You know, a very wonderful, positive, hopeful message that everybody likes to hear. Well, uh, Jesus said the way is broad that leads to destruction and many there be that are on it. It's a nice smooth road that goes along and many people are encouraging each other and having a good time with that. But narrow is the way, straight is the path that leads to life and few there be that find it. Want to eat. Okay, all right. So uh, we, we need to focus on the truth of God's word and be faithful to that truth and let Christ build his church through his word, through his truth. And that will gather people, it will drive others away, but Christ is the one who builds this church and we rest in him and his provision for us in that way. So with that we'll finish uh, today and we've got a lot to consider here on the topic of the church. And uh, so I hope you'll hang in there with that. We're going to be talking about doctrine and uh, life and uh, then the form of government and so forth. So buckle up. We've got a lot to consider. Um, good stuff all the way around. I think especially this idea of the help that God gives us for the Christian life is um, forgotten, lost. You know, sometimes we get to be moralistic and focusing just on duty, uh, what we should be doing, and we don't realize that God's grace enables us and empowers us to live a new life. And that can be a very comforting and encouraging thing um, when we're facing with very powerful temptations and many influences in our hearts and lives. Um, we do have sufficient grace for each day. And uh, you know, it's not that we're going to be uh, super Christians and perfect, but um, we have what we need for each day.